All right, man. Welcome to the introduction for Crow 777 Radio Podcast. This will be episode 99. Jason Lindgren is with me. Uh, We're going to talk primarily about the moon, and we're going to go back through accounts of the moon through time. Uh, And the reason we're going to do this is because you can find commonality. You can find threads of information that are repeated and reiterated in different ways over time across different cultures, which tell us something about the moon. Um, After all, there are so many things in nature we can observe that are directly affected. In other words, the cause is the moon. The effect is things we see in nature. And yet we tend to forget that we are born naked into this natural system. Um, Things like coral, 130 some species in the Great Barrier Reef always spawn, I forget whether it's November or December, under a full moon. This happens over and over and over. There is a direct correspondence there. Um, As we go through some of the old accounts, uh, you've got to use common sense. You know, some of it is hocus pocus, but a lot of it is not. And even the hocus pocus, if you had someone to teach you what was encoded there, there could be more information that could be derived. Also, uh, in the first hour, we get off on a tangent, but it's an important tangent. We start talking about life uh, or plants being the, the carriers of life essence. And in this conversation, we begin to describe to people what's happened with modern juicing and things like this and how the, the very systems we use to get the juice are designed to make sure the juice is dead when you consume it. Uh, we go through and we tell you how you can juice it so that the life essence is still in the juice you consume. Uh, in other words, ingesting life, and there is a massive difference between uh, ingesting something with no life in it and ingesting something with life in it. Anyhow, let's jump in with Jason Lingren for episode 99 and cover primarily what the moon has meant through time, and we'll, we will be able to correspond commonality in these descriptions. Cheers. All right, man. Welcome to Crow Triple Seven Radio Podcast. This is episode 99, getting close to 100 here. Jason Lingren is with me. Um, we're going to open up here talking about a little scientism that is being uh, talked about by science itself, actually. Um, but we are going to jump in and just cover ideas about the moon that have gone back through time. Um, Jason, welcome. Good morning, and I'm back in Baton Rouge in my own comfortable studio. Right. You did that whole conference thing. How was that? Very interesting. Uh, It was great networking. Lots of great people there. And I just want to shout out to Kyle, one of our listeners, who actually came out to meet me specifically because he heard me mention it on the air. So that was awesome. Great dude. That's cool. Always nice to meet nice people. Um, Here we've had our third, what they're calling a nor'easter in, I think, like two weeks. It was ridiculous. I was out there all morning long shoveling snow that weighed more than I do. So there's all that. It's second winter time, didn't you know that? Yeah, it's getting to be that way. I've, I don't think I've ever heard of three nor'easters back to back to back, but what do I know? Anyhow, what would we like to cover? Let's see, what do I have? Oh, I did a, uh, I did about an hour spot with a guy named Scott Truth Sentinel. Um, I don't, I'm not sure when that's going live, but he'll send me a link, so I'll post that out on the website or something. Um, also, Sage Aquay is going to have me back. Um, I think we may be addressing censorship. Not sure everything that we'll address there, but I think we do the pre-record next Monday, uh, if I'm not mistaken. I'll have to check up on that. Do you have anything else before we jump in? A little bit here. Uh, let's just say that the censorship thing is definitely under full swing here because they're going after lots of channels. Yeah, you know, I've been pinged uh, a couple times last day. I, You know, people asked me to come on and I did live streams here and there and one of the people contacted me and said that the live stream I did with them was deleted with no notification they contacted YouTube and YouTube said you deleted that clip told them that they deleted their own clip so not sure what to make of all that but it is pretty clear um, that the modern day book burning is picking up steam a lot of people under the gun out there Right, so the first little bit of news we're going to touch on here, of course, is the official death of Stephen Hawking, science's brightest star, dying at the age of 76. The physicist and author of A Brief History of Time has died at his home in Cambridge. His children said we will miss him forever. He's considered the brightest star in the firmament of science, whose insights shaped modern cosmology and inspired global audiences in the millions. Died at the age of 76, officially. 
So the main purveyor of black holes and things like that that we're supposed to imagine exist. You know, whenever I hear that name, I always think of, I think it was a Simpsons episode where they do a sketch where uh, he stands up and says, I'm sick, something to the effect of I'm sick of sitting in this wheelchair and he walks away. But anyhow, um, from what I understand, Jason, whatever the disease was that he had, he trumped everyone by miles living an incredibly long life when I guess other people die after four or five years. Do you know anything about that? The next person who I've heard of surviving that long with ALS is the name of the disease is the guitarist Jason Becker, who was big in the 80s, 80s shredder, but Hawking beat him by decades. I guess if your brain is big enough, you can overcome anything. Yeah, right. Um, anyhow, we've got some uh, scientism stuff that you dug up that I think is is pretty important to cover. You know, so many people come that are big into science and they look at what you and I are doing and they raise hell about it. And I never quite understand that because the idea of science is to challenge everything. And in the modern age, that's really not where we are at. Uh, it's a bit like a religion, which is why we call it scientism. And even getting scientific people to do something like challenge the moon landing uh, is near impossible. But anyhow, go ahead and cover this. It's quite interesting. Yep, this is an article I found last night on the internet, just from a few months ago. Scientific Bullshit, How Science is Used to Deceive the Public. Did you know that there was a shocking study published in the Public Library of Science Journal that found up to 72% of scientists admitted their colleagues were engaged in questionable research practices and that just over 14% of them were engaged in outright falsification? If that's not bad enough, between 1977 and 1990, the FDA found scientific flaws in 10 to 20 percent of all the studies they audited. But it gets even worse. Scientists at the Thousand Oaks biotech firm Amgen set out to double-check the results of 53 landmark published studies in their fields of cancer research and blood biology. What they found was shocking. Only six of the 53 studies could be proven valid. That means almost 90% were flawed, yet passed off to the public as fact. In other words, there's a lot of scientific bullshit floating around, my friends. This becomes especially concerning when we consider how science seems to have replaced organized religion as the new authority that should blindly be obeyed in many ways. People speak of it as if it is infallible, and anyone who questions the high priests of science are generally attacked, degraded, and dismissed as modern-day heretics. But science, just like any religion, is not a god that only speaks unadulterated truth. It is far from being infallible and is constantly in need of being updated, upgraded, challenged, revised, and changed for the simple fact that science is subject to the narrow confines of mankind's tiny, flawed human perception, which is forever growing and expanding and easily skewed by things like prejudice, pride, and corruption. In and of itself, science is obviously inanimate and can do neither good nor bad because it has no mind of its own. It is not a person, so we need to stop talking about science like it is a superhero. It is simply a vehicle that requires a driver, and the destination obviously differs from one driver to the next. You know, so so much of modern media is pushing the idea of science as a superhero, you know, brings to mind that Matt Damon or Matt Nomad movie uh, where he gets stuck on another planet as if that was possible. And he says he's going to science the shit out of this to, to stay alive. But what's disturbing about this is they went in and they looked at cancer and blood biology research and they found that only six out of 53 had any leg to stand on. And that's a bit disturbing. There's a lot of people out there who may be suffering from cancer other things and believe wholeheartedly that science is delivering legitimate information to them. Um, you know, it's it's and it's true that you're attacked if you question any of this. I've said for a long time that the Gerson method, for one, I think it was the 1930s when they announced they could cure cancer. Um, and then the laws were changed within two, three months to make it illegal to treat cancers with simply plant juices. Not even kidding there. But anything you want to add before we jump into the moon here? Well, shame on anyone who pushes chemotherapy before the Gerson method or cannabis oil, because we know that both of those things have very effective treatment rates. Right. And let's state for the record, we're in the first hour here. That's our point of view, and we are not doctors. So that is correct. Welcome to the modern age of self-censorship, if you want to stay alive uh, and be able to speak to followers that have been with you for years. Uh, it's getting a bit ridiculous. But anyhow, Jason, we're about to jump into the moon here. We're going to cover all kinds of points of view and myth mythology and many things that, that give us insight into how people felt about the moon. But before we do, uh, I want to mention once again 
For years, I have been predicting that if you film what's called a new moon or a very young moon, the blacked out portion of the moon may well be see-through. There are plenty of accounts you can look up, even people from the Royal Academy of Astronomy back in the day who made observations that make this very claim, and they, they were defamed on the tail of it. Um, I have seen some evidence that leads me to believe I'm ac actually on the money here. But the reason I'm pointing this out is because as we come into this equinox that we've talked so much about, there's going to be a new moon for most of us, which is a good opportunity to film. The problem is, is that bright objects are not often occulted or supposedly going behind the moon very often. Uh, my hope is that I'm going to be able to get my full spectrum rig out if we ever see warm weather around here again, uh, because the full spectrum camera will pick up very dim stars. But lastly, before I hand it back to you to jump in, um, I've been looking into eclipses, and it's almost universal that the idea of a solar eclipse is negative in aspect. And I had... Well, while I was filming the last eclipse where I made the comment or the statement, actually, that the moon plays no role in a solar eclipse, uh, I did sun gazing in, as the eclipse was getting underway. And there was this bizarre effect of like a strobing. I don't even know how to describe it. It's totally different than a normal day of sun, sun gazing where the light comes to your eye constant. It was all refracted and jumping all over the place and stroby. And I always, you know, for about two or three days, I was wondering, was that just my my eyes was that a personal experience and then others came forward and said they did the very same thing so uh, there's an interesting effect that more than one person witnessed during an eclipse where if you look straight at the sun if you're trained to sun gaze and by the way if you're not trained to sun gaze don't just go staring at the sun at the sun um, it's something you've got to work up to uh, there's the effect of this bizarre strobing going on and it almost looks like light gone crazy like it's refracting in every which way and pulsing a uh, very strange effect but anyhow jason i'll hand it to you so we can jump into the moon and basically what people have been thinking about the moon through time. Right. So just looking at the word, the moon, the etymological breakdown, late 14th century, the moon, especially as personified in a Roman goddess answering to Greek Selene, also an alchemical name for silver from Latin luna, moon, goddess of the moon, from pi, P-I-E, luxna, L-E-U-K-S-N-A, Source also of Old Church Slavonic Luna Moon, Old Prussian Loxnos, Stars, Middle Irish Luan, Light Moon, Suffered form of root Luke, Light Brightness, Proto-Indo-European root meaning Light and Brightness. It forms all or part of Illumet, Elucidate, Illumination, Illustration, Lea, Leukemia, Leuco, Light, Brightness, Radiant Energy, Lightning, Limb, Link. I could go on and on, but we're going to just throw in there that Lucifer and Luciferus and luminescence and all these things seem to wrap around Luna and Lunar, Lunacy, and all of that. So just want to point out here that if the sun is the sun, S-U-N and S-O-N, and the moon is Lucifer, here we have our duality that we see through so much of our actual history. So, so much of this gets confused because typically the idea of Lucifer is tied to what's called the morning star, which is basically Venus. It's the brightest thing in the sky by a mile unless the sun or the moon are up. It can be both the evening star and the morning star. Most accounts uh, talk of Lucifer being related to this idea, but here again, we see that there are places that tied the moon in with this. And the reason we're going through all these old accounts is because there is a prevailing undercurrent of what people accepted to be correct about the moon. One of the things is that it has to do with controlling moisture. Um, and so many people think that the moon is in the sky and it has no effect on us. And that's a big reason why we're going to cover it in the way we're going to cover it here. There's plenty of observable effects that the moon has a direct effect on life here, um, like horseshoe crabs. Where I'm at, horseshoe crabs show up every, every year at the same time. I forget whether it's a new moon or a full moon that the crabs show up, but there's plenty of examples like this. There's documented cases where it's been shown that lions uh, mostly hunt at night. They're very good night hunters, but during full moons, for some reason, they hunt in the day. Uh, as a person who gardens a lot, I can tell you flat out what I once read about years ago and have confirmed for myself. When you grow herbs, quite often, depending on what you're growing, during a full moon, those herbs will be the most 
potent. And lastly, um, curing meats. There was a, I guess we'd call it a wives' tale, but I think there's something to it where people would never cure meat in a full moon because they felt that the meat would go bad. Um, I don't think I really need to touch on the idea of uh, the Great Barrier Reef. Most people are familiar with that. I forget whether it's November or December, but during a full moon in one of those two months, I forget which, I think it's more than 130 species of corm coral simultaneously spawn. Um, it's been claimed that these coral reefs are the largest living things in our world. The barrier reef is pointed to, but think about what that means. 130 different species, all under the same full moon, all spawn at the same time. These are not arguable things. This shows us flat out that there is actually some kind of cause and effect going on here. Anyhow, back over to you, Jason. Next bit is from the Bible. Deuteronomy 4, 19. And lest thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun, and the moon, and the stars, even all the host of heaven, shouldest be driven to worship them, and serve them, which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. You know, what's interesting about this, and I'm glad you pulled uh, something from the Bible, is like if you go to a lot of the Eastern religions where they do religious artworks called tonkas, uh, I don't think I've ever seen a tonka where the sun and moon are not placed left and right in the upper corners of the religious symbolism there. And they're not alone in that. There are many places. So clearly, back through time, people have openly shown that there is some kind of an effect from both of these bodies. Go ahead, Jason. Next is from the time before the moon. Coyote and eagle steal the sun and moon from the tribe of the Zuni region of Arizona and New Mexico. Back when it was always dark, it was also always summer. Coyote and eagle went hunting. Coyote was a poor hunter because of the dark. They came to the Kachinas, a powerful people. The Kachinas had the sun and the moon in a box. After the people had gone to sleep, the two animals stole the box. At first, Eagle carried the box, but Coyote convinced his friend to let him carry it. The curious Coyote opened the box, and the sun and moon escaped and flew up to the sky. This gave light to the land, but it also took away much of the heat. Thus, we now have winter. So in a lot of these old mythological things, what we find is information is being encoded. And quite often in myth, we find that what's being encoded goes over vast periods of time. Uh, in some of the recent episodes, we showed the Hindu cycle, um, their idea, which is all based in nine, the old numerology, where zero plays no other role than to be a placeholder. Um, what, what these are meant to do, probably, uh, as we examine them, is to do a couple things, to encode ideas that are peculiar peculiar to the culture, um, which is actually well documented in a lot of places. Kabbalah is supposed to be that. Um, but anyhow, to get back to the main point, they're traveling way back uh, to remember things through vast periods of time, and then they're making it culturally correct to who they are at the time. Uh, and the truth is, in most of these things, in my view, you really need a teacher to, to get everything you can out of these myths. But nonetheless, there, there are truths embedded in these things, in my view. The age-old practice of performing farm and planting chores by the moon stems from the belief that the moon governs moisture. The moon's phases guided many farmers and gardeners, both in the past as well as today. So what's interesting is in the modern era, I think the only publication I can really think of uh, that covers things like this is the Farmer's Almanac, which is still going on today. It was some years ago when I had planted in San Diego, and in San Diego you can plant almost any time you want, literally. Very few, very few times of the year there where you won't get success planting. And I had planted some herbs and peppers from seed, and they didn't grow. And when I went back and read in the Farmer's Al Almanac, they were showing times because of the moon's fullness when you didn't plant seed. And they referenced uh, the old traditions this had come from. And I always wondered if it was just a fluke that my stuff didn't grow because in San Diego, again, it's very unusual. I mean, you can throw seeds over your shoulder and they're going to grow if they get water um, that this happened. But I've been thinking about this all these years. But the main point here is people who are interested in these ideas and if you grow things, go get the Farmer's Almanac. It still has a lot of interesting stuff. And again, in this bullet point, we see the idea that the moon governs moisture. And I think that's an important thing to, to remember. And that thing has been around for well over 100 years, right? 150, 200 years? 
Yeah, I forget. There was something with Poor Richard's Almanac um, had to do with one of the founding fathers, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it's been around a long, long time. But the thing about the Farmer's Almanac is it kind of deviates from what science is going to say is acceptable. And it's doing it under the guise of people like to grow things most of the time. So I think it's interesting. One of the few places you can still get uh, maybe what I would call folk information uh, with regard to growing and looking at the year in a different with a different set of eyes than science will offer. All right, so the new moon and first quarter, waxing phases, are considered fertile and wet. The full moon and last quarter, the waning phases, are considered dry. The waxing phases are thought to be good for planting above ground crops, putting down sod, grafting trees, and transplanting. The waning phases are supposedly the best times for killing weeds, pruning, mowing, cutting timber, and planting below ground crops. The best time for planting in drought conditions is just before the full moon, which is considered particularly wet. Some farmers think that seed germination is much better then. So in my view, what we're looking at here uh, is ideas like the farmer's almanac. They use subtlety. They go back to what, what would require a person to use their subtle senses to understand if there is any value being offered up. In my view, there's all kinds of value being offered up here. Um, I went back and looked at these ideas many years ago when I was still growing in San Diego, and I was astonished by what was available in what I'll just call these folk methods um, because they are really far apart from what science accepts. But to put a fine point on it, in the alchemical ideas of doing things with plants, um, it is wholly tied to what phase the sun or where the sun is or what phase the moon is. There's a there there. The problem is, is that we've lost all subtlety. Science doesn't really have subtlety as one of its main characteristics. Um, you can almost, in my view, look at science as swinging a baseball bat and then older natural ideas like alchemy using very subtle, intuitive ideas to get where you're going, but always in step with nature. And I think there's real value there. Um, after all, look how much damage gets done to environments and species and all these other things in the modern era where science is predominant. If we got back to ideas like this and we use subtlety and we gave a damn about the environment, there would be much less damage done all the time. I mean, look how I opened up this episode where I'm talking about three nor'easters in a row. Is that due to weather engineering? If it is, that's a hell of a thing, man. Um, I'm just saying it's a hell of a thing, and there's plenty of evidence to show that likely what goes on is most of the weather we see these days is scheduled. That is complete separation from nature. So go ahead, Jason. To back up a lot of this old history, Pliny the Elder, the first century Roman naturalist, stated in his natural history that the moon replenishes the earth. When she approaches it, she fills all bodies, while when she recedes, she empties them. Right. So basically what's being said, and this is said in a lot of places, even in alchemical texts, that when the moon is called what's waxing, in other words, it's lighting more and more and more, um, there is something being offered to living things in this world. And then when it's waning, in other words, the light is decreasing, 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 uh, the opposite of this is true. And so many people kind of put their nose up in the air and think this is all ridiculousness. I would point out to anyone listening, you can go on right now to the internet and look up the effects of phases of the moon with menstrual cycles in women. There is a there there. There is absolutely a there there. It's just that we don't think about things in any natural way anymore. If we can't put an equation around it or some scientific principle, it's almost like it doesn't matter. And I'm here to tell you that's maybe not so helpful. Getting back to nature and trying to meet nature on nature's level has a lot to offer us. And again, anyone who wants to go out can look up how the moon phases and how it ties to the biological functions in the life of a woman. So there's that. Well, I can tell you doing the research for this, that there was a lot of bipolarness with what I was finding. The scientific side of it, they were dismissing pretty much everything regarding the phases of the moon and how it affects us. There there was some correlation, but not a whole heck of a lot. Then there's the other side, the people who are looking at things from a more natural point of view. And of course, they're saying this can tie to this and this and this and this. So you can see the difference between the modern thinking and, and the more older ways. 
Right. It's about subtlety in my view. And a lot of the subtle things that we can detect are not really weighable or measurable. Um, you know, recently I was going back through uh, Paracelsus, which is an old al alchemist who is revered. Um, and he was talking about the tides. I don't know if people remember many years ago, I was going at the tides where I found basically people tried to tie the ocean's tides to the moon. And they came away with quotes like this is where reason goes to die. They couldn't do it. But in these alchemical texts, which are pretty darn old, supposedly, that I'm reading, it's claimed that every spring there are high tides, and it has to do with the sun, the position of the sun and moon together. Now, funny thing is, is I can observe that right now. I've been, I'm not far from, from ocean water here, and I've been watching how, how high the tides go. So there's something again to this. But when we try to tie simply the tides to the movement of the moon alone, um, from what I have researched, I don't think it can be done. But nonetheless, in the springtime, uh, most places remember the tides as being extra high, and they equate that with the positions of the sun and moon relative to each other. These are hard things to know unless you go at it for a while and give it due study. But again, uh, where's science in all this? If we ask science, they're flat out telling us that the moon controls the tides, and I don't accept that knowing what I know now. Anyhow, back to you. All right, here's some moon folklore collected from farmers over the years. Rail fences cut during the dry, waning moon will stay straighter. Wooden shingles and shakes will lie flatter if cut during the dark of the moon. Fence posts should be set in the dark of the moon to resist rotting. Ozark lore says that fence posts should always be set as the tree grew. To set the root end upward makes a short-lived fence. Don't begin weaning when the moon is waning. Castrate and dehorn animals when the moon is waning for less bleeding. Slaughter when the moon is waxing for juicier meat. Crabbing, shrimping, and clamming are best when the moon is full. Best days for fishing are between the new and full moon. Dig your horseradish in the full moon for the best flavor. And set eggs to hatch on the moon's increase, but not if a south wind blows. So some of these things, you know, the idea of having horseradish that's a better flavor, I've witnessed this firsthand with my herbs when the moon is full. And another thing, uh, when I grew up here uh, in the summer times in New England when I was young, uh, we would always go out in a full moon because you could see better. And we go down to the water and we do crabbing and lobstering and all these other things. And there's something to that, too. I would suggest that everything we have just read here is worth consideration and that we should take more seriously what I will call the folklore of those who live close with nature in the past. Um, science isn't going to give us all the answers here. And one of the main problems that we opened up with talking about science is that this day and age, most of the universities where a lot of science gets done, they're underfunding, which means the people who fund them control the outcome of almost everything. And yet we still have these old sources of people who lived close to nature, who offered up this folklore or wisdom. And I think we should take it more seriously. I think we should take the time to start clean again and observe these things and find out what's valuable from first-hand experience. Anyhow, Jason. So while it's fair to say that all these things may not be 100% accurate, let's just be honest and say science isn't even going to look at them most of the time. They're not going to do any kind of scientific experimentation to compare and contrast whether a lot of these things actually work. So you're going to go by the fact that these people did these things for hundreds of years this way, and then science came along and said, all you got to do is this, this, and this, and you're done. Well, we live in an age where corporation pretty much owns and operates everything. And in the opening, when you were talking about all the errors in cancer research, we can only equate that to corporation. Corporation does not have a concern for people. Corporation has a concern for itself. Even written into the laws of corporation, um, it pretty much dictates that above all other concerns, the corporation will be fed a little better next year and you got to try to grow it next year. And so what we find is in, in cases of things like cancer research, research, the pharmaceutical companies have gotten involved. And I don't think we need to go down that road for anyone to understand that that is not the best way we could go with these things. So again, um, we are looking at things here that cannot be put on a scale and weighed and measured, which means science will call them poppycock. And I'm here to say uh, these things are not poppycock. There's a lot of value to be found here. And I never would have known any better had I not been growing things and gotten my hand many years ago on a farmer's almanac where I learned so much and began to understand the subtlety that a human being can be involved with nature. Go ahead, Jason. 
So let's just be honest here. Companies like Monsanto absolutely do not want you to use the old ways. They want you to have to buy seeds from them year after year. They have what's called terminator seeds. And all that means is those seeds can be used once and then they're dead. And unlike the past where you would cultivate the seeds from your previous crop for the next season, Monsanto wants you coming back to have to buy them again. So modern corporations absolutely do not want you even remotely using the old ways in any way, shape or form because it doesn't profit them. You know, we seem to be in a time where a lot of people are taking an interest in the older ways. And while corporations try to beat the hell out of nature to force it to do what it wants to do, Monsanto being a good example, how many people do you know right now that are vegetarian? How many people do you know right now that want to eat organic produce? How many people do you know right now that are trying to produce their old organic food? So what we're covering here speaks to those people who are really not down with what corporation is about bioengineering seeds, buying up all the heirloom seeds in the world and then genetically engineering them, producing chemicals that are horrible that allow only their seed to be produced and then putting farmers under contract so that the farmer is beholden to companies like Monsanto to get their seed for the next year. Um, I think there's a lot of us out here who appreciate an episode like this, who are prepared to go back and look at the older ways now and try to find the subtlety in working with with nature that we've kind of lost our way. You know, this whole thing with organic and, and all that sort of thing, it's really sick when you think about it. Over a hundred years ago, there was no organic or non-GMO or that. There was just food. Food was food. You grew it, you ate it. That's it. Now, when you look at the grocery store shelves, let's say, the organic stuff costs so much more. Well, that's because it's actually done the right way. It's, it's done, hopefully, anyway. It's done naturally without a whole bunch of chemicals and pesticides, all that other crap. So you're just basically buying food. Everything else that is cheaper is because they're mass-producing processed garbage to feed you. So, of course, it's going to trick you into thinking that this stuff is good because it's cheaper and can save you money. But the reality is that's not really food per se. It's food stuff. And it's certainly nutrient deficient. That's for damn sure. Well, it's a hell of a time we've come to, Jason, when one of the main concerns for people who oh, truly want to be healthy is how do I ever go about getting produce that's edible without chemicals on it? How can I get water to drink that hasn't been tampered with? I mean, you would think that these are among the most basic things. And when we look at why our food supply has gotten like this, it's because corporations and governments have done this intentionally. Um, it's a crazy, crazy thing to get to this point. You know, it wasn't too long ago, my wife and I went into a grocery store and we just randomly decided one day that we were going to just start grabbing products off the shelf and try to find things that did not have high fructose corn syrup in it. And we, <laughs> we blew our own minds. I think we found like three or four things, even like lunch meats, you know, something like ham or something like that, where you wouldn't expect to see high fructose corn syrup there it was. And this goes beyond kind of corporation just doing its thing. You know, we even things like this, like there would be one product that had way too much salt. So they'd be selling another product that had less salt. But to get the less salt product, in other words, it cost them less to make it, you had to pay more. There was no rhyme or reason. And as we really began to look, we almost came to the conclusion all at once that there's not even really a way to shop in the modern grocery store and be healthy. There just isn't. And here on the East Coast, so far from San Diego, where I could go in San Diego, there's a million farmers markets everywhere. Everyone's growing organic. It's not that easy here. And it gives a real window. I mean, when you're in December and you want some organic oranges, you got to work at it. But how is it that we've come to a time like this, Jason, where um, just to get good, decent food and clean water is damn near impossible for so many parts of our country? It's a hell of a thing to think about, and I think it's, it gives us every reason to start doing episodes like this to show people that there are older ways, and in my view, there are infinitely better ways. Anyhow, man, back to you. Well, I, I think this is a direct example of what's wrong with yeah, I don't want to say all Western countries, but America definitely has this issue. And a lot of people just don't realize it. It's not just that Americans are fat and lazy. It's because they don't know the difference between what they're eating and what they should be eating. And this is what's causing the obesity and all that. There's absolutely 
No question whatsoever, because there are a lot of countries, cultures who eat high fatty foods or, or things like that that you would normally associate with obesity and, or being overweight, yet they're thin as a rail and healthy. You know, some of the brightest minds that I have met online um, are wholly vegetarian people. Um, there's a number of them that I have met. And funny enough, a lot of people who smoke pot seem to be very clever these days and uh, maybe a little bit above the programming. But many years ago, I came to realize what I'd been reading about alchemy and other places, that plants are the carriers of life essence. I know that to a certainty for myself now. No one can ever come to me and tell me any different. And the point in the road where I confirmed that, I was accepting it, but I didn't have a direct corollary to know certainly that it was a fact. When I got to the Gerson method and I went in and I understood that all modern juicers are using blades and these little screens, which basically decimate all the life that can be juiced out of a plant, and we went and used the Gerson method, I was astounded, man. We did it for like three days the first time, and I felt like I was 16 years old again. You can actually feel when you drink that juice the life going back into you and it was that point forward that i truly began to separate myself away from the modern ways and to look for value in the older ways and there's no guarantee you've got to use common sense you've got to use your higher mind there's you know you can find problems in almost anything you look at but what i found is these older ways have a subtlety and an in syncness with nature that is valuable beyond measure. And if so many of us would be following those older ways, maybe it wouldn't be so easy for people to come pollute a water supply with fluoride and, and you know chlorine and all these things they put in it. Maybe it wouldn't be so easy for corporations to put all these boxed foods on the shelf that are basically nutrition nutritious nutrition depleted. And not to mention that even if it wasn't nutrition depleted there is no life in it and any person who has learned how to properly juice a plant so that the life from that plant is going into your body will be stunned and amazed at i mean it's for me i think i was in my late 30s the first time i did it and i felt like i was 16 years old again instant energy instant just amazement at understanding all at once it's true plants are the, the carriers of the life essence. Anyhow, I'm getting kind of wandering off track here, Jason. Well, I think you're bringing up an important point here. Why don't you explain the difference between juicing methods? Because most people go out and buy a juicer. It's kind of what I have. And I do get a good sense of uh, well-being when I juice and drink it. That my, my girlfriend and I have been doing that. But I think you're referring to a different procedure that yes. is more expensive to acquire, which I would like to eventually get as well. I've never tried juice through the uh, the other method. I, I unfortunately only have the inexpensive method. Well, I can address a couple things here that will help people who are interested. Basically, most of the modern juicers that you can go to Walmart and pick up very cheaply have a spinning blade and then this tiny little gridded metal network that forces all the cells to be squished and broken and decimated. So first you have a spinning blade with heat, by the way, which also kills the juice. And then it's forced through these tiny little apertures. And by, by my estimation, they did this on purpose. The way things like the Gerson method that are truly going to give the living embodiment and essence of that plant into your body are done like this. You use an old-fashioned grinder to grind up the plant into a pulp. Then you fold it in a sterile cloth and you use a press so it is pressed out. There's no heat. There's no spinning blade. And all of the living cells in that juice are not being forced through a micro mesh of metal. And it's night and day. And that's not to say, you know, if people are out there juicing, good on you. Even if you're using the, the bad juicer I just described, it is a far sight better than just having some macaroni and cheese. You know, <laughs> don't get me wrong. The problem here is you are mostly not getting the life essence of that plant. And as Jason pointed out, these juicers, um, shoot, I forgot the name of them. Anyone could look it up. Masticating juicer? Well, it's got a grinder and a press. I should have looked it up before we did it. Anyone can look up the Gerson method and they'll see. Um, they're expensive and for most people too expensive. But I recently went online to look for what's called an Apple press. And I'm, I'm getting one of these now. For 125 bucks, you get a hand crank press and it does a similar thing. Like you could take a knife and cut up apples as an example and you put them in this bag and then use the old fashioned hand press screw method to 
press the juice out, but the thing you're pressing out still has life in it. The one I'm getting is good for grapes and apples. Um, you can look these up. I think it's mostly called apple presses. You'll see all different versions of them, but these absolutely will give you that living life essence into your body. In other words, the plant is alive. You grind it up or do whatever you do, cut it up, and then you press it, the life is still in that juice as it enters your body. And that is an idea that is so far from the modern way of things. Um, and it tells you something else about the other foods we eat. If a food is dead, then you are not eating life. If you take an orange and you peel it and you eat it, you are eating life. Basically, you're eating the sun. If you if you want to break it down to its constituent kind of most basic way you could think of it, um, you're, it's almost like you're eating pure sunlight in a way. But to get to the point, you are eating something alive and that life is being transferred into your body. Um, and so many people don't think about food in this way anymore. And so many of us get fooled into going to Walmart and thinking just juicing alone is the best we can do. And I'm here to tell you um, those juicers were designed to ensure that most of life is removed from that juice before it goes down your throat. So there's all that, Jason. So what you're saying is juicing organic produce is better for you than grabbing a monster that's on sale two for four bucks at the Quickie Mart, right? <laughs> By a long shot. And there's another there, there's another thing to juicing too. Like my wife and I were doing the Gerson method. And one day we juiced and we did most of the things that are usually prescribed for cancer patients because we were just learning and doing it. But we realized that we had drank a whole head of lettuce. Now, if you wanted to eat it, of course, that's another way to get the living um you know, embodiment of the essence of life out of that plant. But how many times would you ever sit down and eat an entire head of lead, lettuce? And that's another thing I noticed about the juicing. When we juiced, I realized I had just ingested like four or five apples, a quarter of a head of lettuce, and probably half of a bunch of carrots, maybe as many as eight or nine of them in one eight ounce shot of juice. And so there's all that. Yeah, that's that's a definitely good for you. <laughs> Yeah, I, I can't tell you. For anyone who, who has been living the modern way and not eating that healthy, to go and actually drink living juice, it's an eye-opener. You feel the life essence go into your body. And I have accepted for years and years and years now, without doubt, and actually went, Gerson lived in San Diego, but had to run her clinic in Mexico because the United States had outlawed her trying to treat cancer patients with juices from plants. And I met tons of people there, and I'm not in doubt anymore. I understand that there are there are cures for cancer, and I understand that plants are the carriers of life essence. Anyhow, Jason. And last point I want to make on that is I have friends in Europe who have told me that there is a massive difference between the food there and the food that you would get here in America. It's a control mechanism, folks. I can't put it any plainer than that. It's one of the many ways they're attacking us to keep us down and easy to control, and that's that. It's the bane of modern existence, and it is powered by corporation. And uh, I have, too, also many friends in Europe, and their food is abundantly, in most places, better than it is in the United States. As a matter of fact, from what I've seen, the United States may have one of the lowest thresholds for nutritious foods of any industrialized nation. And the thing that fuels this, the power, the muscular arm doing this, is called corporation. Jason. Absolutely. And the thing is, the people in Europe really wouldn't stand for it if they tried to completely take over their food supply like they have in the United States. You know, media played a big role. You know, what you're looking at in many parts of Europe is the traditional way that they lived. They farmed. They did these things. They created these different kinds of food, which are have so much more healthful benefit in them than anything we're getting from a supermarket. It would be hard to go into these places and make them go against their cultural norms. Where here in the United States, I've said so often, we don't really have a culture here. We like some TV shows and we watch some movies. For the most part, that is the average culture of an American. And what that has done is I can remember all the way back to when I was young and the first TV dinners were coming around. You can see the slow push from the, the arrival of TV dinners to where we are now, where we have these mega supermarkets that are stuffed to the brim with food that has next to no nutritional value or healthful benefit. It's a culture of distraction, and that's it. That's all this is. They just bombard you with one thing to the next and keep you 
away from the natural ways. And a lot of people who might come from what would be considered a poorer country might actually be more in touch with reality than the average American who's sitting and drooling in front of a television set for 10 hours a day. You know, another big eye opener I had in my life was when I went to South Korea. I did it once in the United States Marine Corps, and then I did it another time after uh, with some work I was involved in during the stage phase of my life where I was a roadie. It's a whole cultural thing to see how they eat there. Even their food is color coded. And there's this whole thing going on where to, to know you've gotten a balanced meal, um, the colors play into it. You know, you need all these different colors, but the food is so intricately tied to the culture. I've thought for a long time, it's not going to be easy to get those people to throw all that by the wayside. Every household is making kimchi. Um, and then again, over in China, uh, there's all these old sayings that say things like, if your doctor has come and his prescription did not include food, then that doctor has wasted your time, something to that effect. And we've totally lost that here in the West. We don't equate that what we put in our bodies has a direct correspondence to our health. And when is the last time anyone here in America went to the doctor and the doctor prescribed a dietary plan? Most of the time, if you're overweight, you might hear something about diet. If you've got high High blood pressure, you'll pry hear the salt spiel. And if you've got other things, they may say something about sugar. But on the whole, the idea of diet is separated almost wholesale from our idea of medicine here in the West, uh, for the most part. That's not wholly true, but for the most part. I could tell you that a big difference between going to see a people doctor and an animal doctor is that the people doctor will throw drugs at you to deal with the problem, whereas an animal doctor will use nutrition as a means of dealing with any particular situation. And there should not be so such a difference between those things. Absolutely, nutrition should be considered a major part of any way of dealing with an ailment or, or whatever problem you're having, but it seems to be absolutely barely a consideration. Well, in a lot of the Asian cultures, all of the foods are broken down like with a kind of yin and yang idea, and they deal with ideas like we're talking about here with the moon, uh, the moon having to do with moisture. That would play directly into the idea of a lot of Asian medicines where they'll even go so far as to say your body's too hot, so you'll eat these cool foods. And you're not just looking at hokum here. You're looking at a tradition that probably goes back thousands of years if we have a timeline like that to even gaze upon. My point here is is that it is absolutely true, and we all know it, that you are what you eat. And if you understand and accept that plants are the carrier of life essence, you have learned an important thing, and you know an important thing. But anyhow, we're, we're cranking around the dial here, Jason. Let's get a little more of the moon in before we close up the first hour. Regarding good luck, it is lucky to see the first sliver of a new moon clear of the brush or unencumbered by foliage. It is lucky to own a rabbit's foot, especially if the rabbit was killed in a cemetery by a cross-eyed person at the dark of the moon. I like that one. <laughs> yeah. It is lucky to hold a moonstone in your mouth at the full moon. It will reveal the future. It is lucky to have a full moon on the moon day, which is a Monday, of course. It is lucky to expose your newborn to the waxing moon. It will give the baby strength. It is lucky to move into a new house during the new moon. Prosperity will increase as the moon waxes. All right. So a couple of these bullet points you just read, you can see where science gets its ammunition to fire off <laughs> at the older folk based ways. Um, and it's a shame. But, you know, this is what I mean by you've got to use common sense when you go back at finding value in these older ways. From my view, chopping off a rabbit's foot uh, probably isn't going to bring me too much luck. But that's just my point of view. Well, it didn't work for the rabbit, did it? No, that was very unlucky for the rabbit, and I would suggest that maybe the person who took the foot might inherit some of that. Regarding bad luck, it is unlucky to see the first sliver of a new moon through a window. You'll break a dish. <laughs> it is unlucky to point at the new moon or view any moon over your shoulder. It is unlucky to sleep in the moonlight, or worse, be born in the moonlight. It is unlucky to see the old moon in the arms of the new, or the faint image of the full disk while the new crescent moon is illuminated, especially if you're a sailor, storms are predicted. And it is unlucky to have a full moon on Sunday, although some of these folklore folks also say Saturday. 
So I guess the idea there would be Sunday is the day of the sun and Saturday is the day of Saturn. Um, these go back to the to the alchemical divisions of nature. But again, we see the same thing about luck being mixed in, probably fueling many scientists out there to yell poppycock and move on down the road. But anyhow. On courting and having children. According to folklore, if a young woman sees a dove and glimpses the new moon at the same instant, she should repeat Bright moon, clear moon, bright and fair, lift up your right foot, there'll be a hair. When she removes her shoe, she'll find a hair the color of her future husband's. <laughs> All right, we need to go out and start doing tests on this right away to see if there's any there there. <laughs> but anyhow, let's keep pushing through the hocus here. Marriages consummated during the full moon are most prosperous and happy, according to ancient Greeks, while a waning moon bodes ill for wedded bliss. So the average listener might be wondering why we go through these things, but there is a reason, even the uh, the birthday cake. You know, I've said so often that it's probably not helpful for us to count birthdays. Um, we're lighting candles and then snuffing them out for every year we've been alive. But I track that back to an old moon uh, thing that went on supposedly in ancient Greece where the cake that's illuminated is supposed to be the moon itself. And it was attributable to the moon goddess of the Greeks. But when you take basic things like this apart, it gives you at least a new way to view things we do. I was wondering how the hell did we ever get a birthday cake with candles that represent how long we've been alive and then we snuff them all out. And then come to find out the reason we turn off the lights and light the birthday cake, it was originally representing the moon. And as we've come Covered off in here, you know, almost always the moon has to do uh, with insanity, sleep, and death. Anyhow, Jason. The full moon is an ideal time to accept a proposal of marriage. Though nobody can be sure of when a baby will be born, moon lore suggests that births are more likely to occur seven days before through seven days after a full moon. There's a thing that people could, I mean, there's got to be statistics to check that kind of thing out, but anyhow. Yeah, I would think so. The Navajos, among others, believe that the full moon's pull on a woman's amniotic fluids increases the chances of giving birth at this time. Some nurses and midwives claim the new moon is also an active time for births. So I think when we get to points like this, it goes to show you that there is a reason to hear about look at and try to understand the older ways. Um, everything we know about the moon, even the fact that they claim the moon controls the tides, which I don't accept as it's described, plays into an idea like this. I think there is something to be gleaned here. Anyhow, man. And the last one, according to folklore, babies born a day after the full moon enjoy success and endurance. This next thing we're about to get into has directly, in my view, is directly correlatable to China supposedly having a robot on the moon. And as we get into it, the myth that we're going to cover here by Chang Yi or change as it would be in English uh, was first mentioned by the Apollo mission crew, a guy named Collins, I think, if I remember correctly, talking about the Chinese myth, which was then echoed all those years later when China was about to tell us they were going to land a robot on the moon. Here's the root and the basis in the same way in this part of the world we named after Greek myth. Here is all the Chinese myth that got tied up in their little shenanigans of supposedly going to the moon. Right, so the myth of Chang'e. There's a very famous Chinese myth about this woman who is said to live on the moon. There are different variations of the myth, but the basic story is that she and her husband were once immortal beings who were made mortal because of their bad behavior. They then attempted to achieve immortality again through the use of a pill, but Chang'e got greedy and took too much of the pill and ended up floating up to the moon where she remained stuck over time. She is the subject of much Chinese poetry and is one of the central reasons for celebration each autumn during the Chinese Moon Festival. So that name, Chang Yi or Chang Ye, basically looks like change in English, uh, was one of the names for one of the supposed robots that didn't go to the moon uh, from China. But this next one is, I believe, actually the name of the rover itself that didn't go to the moon, if I remember correctly. And to reiterate, back in the Apollo missions, there's a transcript anyone could look up where Collins is talking about this Chinese myth, all the, pre-echoing all these years earlier before China was ever even considered to possibly be going to the moon, where he says something to the effect of look for the rabbit standing under the cinnamon tree on the moon. And then he mentions the uh, the girl there too, change or Chang Ye. Anyhow, go ahead, Jason. 
Right. The last one for hour one is the story of the moon rabbit. And this is an interesting myth because it crosses over several different cultures. The moon rabbit, or jade rabbit, is said to be one of the companions that Chang'e eventually was allowed to have with her while she was on the moon. However, it is also a symbol that shows up in myths about the moon in Korea and Japan. So I would ask everyone listening, we get all these myths through time, and then when we correlate them up to the modern era, in the case of the supposed moon missions from America, uh, they were all named after Greek myth, Apollo, Gemini, all these other things. When we translate this over to what the Chinese were telling us they were doing, their myths filled the gap. So to me, that, that pretty plainly points that there is something there to know in these myths or they wouldn't be carried on forever and ever and ever. Uh, I think part of it is is that they're telling us a tale and so they're using a tale to name what they're doing, but there's more to it than that. But anyhow, Jason, is there anything you'd like to add before we close up the first hour? Well, it's obvious while some of these things are just kind of silly, there's a lot to be said for the ways of the past versus what's going on today and keep an open mind and i would say for yourself find a really good marriage between the two you know in so many of the older ways in my view there is a better way because you're working hand in hand with nature you're not trying to muscle your way over nature or force nature to be whatever you think it should be and i think there's real value to that in these times where even our drinking water is a concern and when we're faced to, you know, with, with buying food each month at the grocery store, we walk in and there's a whole building of food and almost all of it is devoid of nutrition and certainly very little of it has life essence in it. Anyhow, that brings the first hour of Crow 777 Radio Podcast Episode 99 to a close. In the second hour, we're going to dig into everything moon and finish out the tale of all the older myths that have said things about the moon. And again, to remind everybody here on the 17th in Rhode Island, we're going to have what's called the true equinox and there will be a new moon, a new moon for those who don't understand is blacked out. You can't see it. But I think it is all the more reason to film during this time, because not only are we going through an equinox, which may or may not be tied to the lunar wave that I filmed in 2012, it also gives us an opportunity to try to film a new moon to see if it is transparent at these times. Anyhow, hope to see you all over at Crow777Radio.com for the second hour. At the posting of this episode, there will be 99 free hours of content that do not require a login. If you'd like to become a member, you're in fact supporting free speech. The things we could not address in the first hour will certainly be addressed in the second. There it is, man. Cheers. Cheers.